Good afternoon, or good evening, everyone, and welcome to another weekly recap of our chronological Bible reading. We're following the Reese Chronological Bible. This is the copy of the one that I have that I've had for several years. Uh, there are some newer, updated versions with a different cover on the front of them. But I found this Reese Chronological Bible several years ago when I lived in Washington State. And I liked the way it presented the chronology of the passages in the Bible. And so I have followed that. And I could only find that in the Old King James translation. So if you are one of those who have our reading materials, uh, you will have uh, probably received it in a three ring binder that presents the scriptures in a New King James translation. And I have divided the reading into various days and put one month reading in a three ring binder. So we begin on January 1st and we're finished if we stay on track by the 16th of November. So I have uh, 11 binders. Uh, the first 10 are usually one inch binders and that last one ending on the 16th of November ends up being just a, a half inch binder because it's only about a half a month reading. And I put that particular reading material in each of those binders and divide it up into the various days if you're familiar with our reading material. And so I wanted to share that with you and point out to you that we're now at the end of week number 20 of our reading. Uh, today's uh, 21st of May 2022. And uh, we're soon to be approaching the halfway point of our reading material. And the time frame in which we're reading about in this week's reading that we're bringing to a close today is about a 45 year period. Reese's dating in the margins of the Bible shows from 945 uh, BC to about 900 BC. And uh, we will, that's kind of a ballpark figure. In fact, we came through this week's reading discussing or reading about the death of Solomon. And his son, Rehoboam, became the next king. During the time of Saul and David and Solomon's reign, all of Israel was one united kingdom, the 12 tribes with the temple at Jerusalem. Uh, well, that was the tabernacle at that point until Solomon got the temple built and then the temple was at Jerusalem. But we come to a milestone in our reading uh, this week in that the, the uh, kingdom was divided during the time of Solomon's son, Rehoboam. And at the first of the week's reading, we read about the death of Solomon. And then we started to see about the chronology of the 12 tribes, their descendants, and so forth. And we read about Rehoboam becoming the king. And we read about the fact that Rehoboam took bad counsel from some young advisors and did not heed the good counsel of the older advisors. And it resulted in there being a split in the kingdom into northern Israel and southern Judah. And if you would have had a, a Reese chronological Bible that you would have been reading through, it would have shown the division like this. On the right hand side, you'll see there's a line there in the page, a vertical line. And what Reese does from this point forward is that he puts the scriptures that he assigns to dealing with northern Israel on one side of the page. And on the other column, he'll put the passages that have to do with southern Judah. There were 10 tribes that identified with northern Israel. And there were two tribes, the tribes of Benjamin and the tribes of Judah that made up southern Judah. So it was like there was civil war or there would have been a civil war, but God instructed Rehoboam not to go to battle against Israel at that particular time. 
And early in the week, we read about this man whose name was Jeroboam. He had been exiled, or at least he ran away from some authorities and some potential problems that he foresaw with Solomon and uh, went to Egypt. And when he heard that Solomon was dead, uh, he asked uh, the Pharaoh to allow him to leave and go back to his homeland. And he was basically anointed by God's direction from a prophet to become the king over northern Israel. And he was told that if he would obey God, that God would bless him. What we're going to realize as we read through the Old Testament from this point forward until we get to the end of the Old Testament is that all of the kings in southern Judah were direct descendants of King David. And that has to be because God had promised through the Abrahamic covenant and through the Davidic covenant that David's descendants would sit on the throne until the last king came along, which would be the Messiah, and would set up his kingdom, which would have no end. But the kings of the northern uh, nation of northern Israel uh, did not follow after direct descendancy from David. And in fact, Jeroboam became their first king. And what we discover is that uh, various kings in the north were either killed by opposition or died, and some other family would take over the kingship and kind of have their little short family dynasty, so to speak. What we also discover as we read through beginning this week and then beyond this week until northern Israel goes into captivity. In fact, you may have noticed in this particular page, the subheadings there, it says that this is the dates and the time from the... Uh, splitting up of the kingdom, the divided kingdom from Solomon to the fall of Israel. And that is in reference to when Israel will go into captivity to the Assyrians around the year 722 BC. So it's some years away in our reading uh, from this week. But what we're going to see is that every one of the kings in the north are described as being bad or evil. And about half or more of the kings from southern Judah will be described as bad or certainly not uh, good kings. And so that's kind of setting the stage for what we began to read this week. So Reese assigned various passages. A lot of times you will have noticed in our reading that there would be either between one of the chapters or several chapters in the book of Samuel or 2 Samuel would be very similar, almost word for word the same as what we read in 1 Kings. And we'll see that sometimes in Kings and Chronicles, passages mirror one another. And whenever that happens, Reese would use one group of them to uh, put in the column under the heading of Northern Israel. He would use another set of those passages, mirrored passages, in the column that referred to or he assigned to southern Judah. So that would be a little bit of an explanation. But when, when I make the reading material that some of you have, I didn't have the expertise <laughs> to put columns on my pages. And so I would just put a heading, a subheading of Israel in bold print and underlined or a subheading of Judah so that it would then show the particular verses that Reese assigned to each of those kingdoms, northern Israel and southern Judah. So we came along about the second or third day of this week, and we read an interesting story about a prophet. We would call him an unknown or unnamed prophet. We were never given his name. But he came from southern Judah, and he went to Bethel, which is in northern Israel, and that was the place where the kings of northern Israel had their palace and their headquarters, so to speak. And he went there uh, to pass, uh, gives a word of prophecy uh, when Jeroboam was the king of northern Israel, that first king. God instructed this prophet that he was to go there 
to give the message that he was told to give and then return. He was not to return the same way that he went there. And he was not to stay there or spend time with anybody. He wasn't even to have a meal there. He was supposed to go in there, deliver his message and leave. And he was in the process of doing that. And he got sidetracked uh, by an old man who himself he thought was a prophet of northern Israel. And he lied to this prophet from southern Judah. And the long and the short of the story was uh, the prophet with no name that we know of from southern Judah. God allowed to be killed because of his disobedience and not following the instructions to the letter that God gave him. And so that was kind of an interesting story, how a lion met him and killed him. And then the lion and the donkey that the man was riding on stood there in the field. And this prophet that had been slain was lying there in the field. And the lion didn't eat the, the man that he had killed. And so word got back to town and this lying prophet went to him and gathered him up. And when he went there, we read that there was the donkey and there was the lion and there was the dead prophet. And so he carried him back and had him put in his own grave and gave instruction that when he died, his bones were to be buried with that man's bones. So it's kind of an interesting story. Well, in the midst of the generations of these multiple kings that we read about, we begin to read back and forth between the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah. Uh, we see that God remembered the covenant that he made with David. And he said that he would not completely do away with southern Judah. What we'll discover is that northern Israel will go into captivity to the Assyrians around 722 BC and will eventually then get to when southern Judah will also go into captivity to the nation of Babylon. And that will be over during the time when we're reading through uh, Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Daniel. And it will be some 100 years later, around 605 BC, when they go into captivity. So we're just getting started in reading through these uh, bits of information about the various kings, either from northern Israel or southern Judah. And so we read about a time when the Ethiopians were coming to war against southern Judah. And the man who was the king at that time was a man named Asa. And he realized that they were outnumbered and he was distraught. And he went to God in prayer and humbled himself and asked for God's blessing and guidance and help. And he said, Lord, basically, it's no big deal whether a, a large number or a small number as long as you're involved in it, uh, there can be victory won. And God blessed him. In fact, God is the one that basically, from what we read this week, went to war against the Ethiopians and provided the victory. And so as we continue to read through the week, we see about this man Asa and how that he was a good king. We read about three kings from southern Judah this week. Uh, the first one, well, there was Solomon and then from the divided kingdom, Rehoboam, and then his son, and then his grandson, whose name was Asa. And Rehoboam and his son were said to have been bad kings. And Asa was said to have been a good king. And yet when we get to the end of our reading this week and we come to uh, uh, the end of the week's reading, we find that there was this conflict always between northern Israel and southern Judah. And Asa, instead of relying upon God to help in that particular time against northern Israel, he took it upon himself to hire uh, Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, and his army uh, to break fellowship with northern Israel and to help southern Judah get a victory over Israel. And what we discovered from that was that God then sent word to him that because he had done this and not relied upon him as he had done earlier when there had been conflict with the Ethiopians, that uh, 
Asa then would, and all of Israel or southern Judah, would have constant battles from that time forth going forward. So what we learned from this week's reading was that God blesses those who repent and humble themselves and go to him in prayer and ask for his help and confess that they are dependent upon God and his provision and blessing and mercy. And God did that. But then we also see that that doesn't necessarily negate the consequences of disobedience and sin. In one particular time when one of the uh, groups had been uh, threatened by an enemy and they repented and God spared them, but then he did allow for them to be servants to the people that were coming against them. So as we would try to make application, which is what we should do with all of our reading, especially through the Old Testament, is to try to picture ourselves in the shoes and the lifetime of the people that we're reading and how would we react and then take the biblical principles from what we read of those times in Old Testament times and bring those principles forward into our lives and to make application in our lives. And what we discover is that God is merciful and long-suffering and he desires that we all if we get into a time of disobedience and sin against him, that we repent and seek his forgiveness and humble ourselves before him and confess our wrongdoings and ask for his mercy. And he's faithful and just to do that. When we get over into the New Testament, especially towards the end of the New Testament, in John the Apostle's writing of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, especially in the little epistle of 1st John, he will make the statement, if we are faithful to confess our sins, God will be faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But it doesn't necessarily take away the consequences from our, dis our disobedience and our sin. So that would be a takeaway that we have here from this week's reading. Well, at the end of our reading today, about this King Asa, God had sent Hanani or Hanani, uh, the seer, as he was referred to in scripture, to Asa to reprimand him for hiring the Syrians against their relatives, northern Israel, instead of trusting the Lord for uh, total victory. And that from that time on, they would have to fight wars. So this week's reading has been somewhat of a transition period, transitioning from a unified nation of Israel that had been together since the time of the judges and then the first King Saul and then King David and King Solomon. But now after Solomon's death and Rehoboam his son took the throne, then there was a division and there were 10 tribes that were identified as Northern Israel. There were two tribes, the tribes of Judah and Benjamin that were identified as Southern Judah. One of the things that we read about this week was some various tribes that would have been residing in the North had moved or come back down into Southern Judah. In our day and time, for example, we may hear people talk about the 10 lost tribes of Israel. That's a reference to the 10 tribes that were in northern Israel, who we will read in the future, going into captivity to Assyria, and they never returned as a nation. We will then read a little bit beyond that about southern Judah going into captivity to the Babylonians. And they're told by the prophet Jeremiah that they will be in captivity for 70 years and after 70 years has expired they will be allowed to come back to their homeland and so there's this idea that southern Judah recovered and came back from captivity but northern Israel did not come back from captivity and so people assigned that way of thinking ending up in this 
phrase, the ten lost tribes of Israel. But in God's eyes, they're not lost. And there are some groups of people in even our day and time that try to identify themselves as part of those ten lost tribes. And that's just not biblically sound. And God knows where they are. They're not lost to him. And we can even read scripture. And when we come across passages from this point going forward that indicate that the tribes are all accounted for, and that there are at least representatives from every tribe still spoken about in Scripture, we'll point those out. But as we move forward, we'll begin to see the lives and the decision-making processes of the kings in the north and the kings in the south. And it will continue to have the appearance of a spiritual roller coaster ride going up and down and good decisions and bad decisions and, and God... Uh, uh, hearing their pleas for mercy and helping them and then them becoming disobedient again. And we'll see the various reforms that some of the good kings bring about in southern Judah. So we have kind of a windy, rocky road ahead of us in our reading from this point going forward. But one of the things that we'll notice when we get over into the book of Ezekiel towards the, at least chronologically speaking, towards the end of the Old Testament, that God will promise that he will restore the nation of Israel as one unified nation again. We'll read that he will even tell Ezekiel to take two sticks, put Israel's name on one, put Judah's name on the other, and bind them together so that they're one stick, indicating an object lesson that God said that one day way out into the future, he will restore the two nations into one unified nation again and will set them up to become the head of nations again in the kingdom age when Jesus comes back to set up his kingdom. And my personal opinion is that we've begun to see that take place in that since 1948, the nation of Israel has been recognized by the United Nations and all of the rest of the world as a bona fide nation. And even our previous president recognized uh, Jerusalem as the capital of Israel and moved our embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. And when we were able to go to the Holy Land a few years ago, it was not long after that embassy had been moved and we were able to take pictures uh, of our group there in front of the U.S. Embassy that was then in the city of Jerusalem. Well, I believe that during our lifetime, we have seen that uh, Jews from all over the world have begun to uh, come back into the, the country of Israel. And I think it is a prophetic thing that's being fulfilled before our very eyes, which is another reason I believe that we're approaching the end of the age in which we're living. And, anticipate the soon return of the Lord Jesus Christ. But it may not be this week. It might not be tomorrow. It may not be for several hundred years. We don't know that. The Bible doesn't give us a date. But it does tell us that uh, we can observe the times and the seasons, and it sure seems that it might not be far off. Well, next week we'll have another weekly recap and see if we can get a little bit more information about the comparison of the decisions and how the decisions of one man as a leader affects a whole nation of people. And we find that to be true in our day and age too, don't we? Amazing. The Bible written several thousand years ago, and yet it is up to date as if it was from yesterday's newspaper. So hang in there and keep up with your reading. We'll have another recap next week. Father, thank you so much for loving us and for providing your word for us. And uh, help us that we might understand and learn the scriptural principles you would have us to take from reading through the Old Testament. Thank you for those who are joining us online and reading along in the chronological Bible with us. We pray for your blessings on them and their families and homes. Father, we do anticipate and desire and look forward to the soon return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We pray that it will be soon. Yet, as Jesus himself prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, not by will, but thy will be done. 
So we trust in your timing being perfect. Thank you again for your blessings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a good Lord's Day tomorrow. Enjoy fellowshipping with other believers. We'll see you next week. Lord bless you.